Hello everyone, here we are today in week four of our introduction to Brazil. And today we're going to talk about revolt, consolidation, and war from 1830 to 1870 in Brazil. This information is taken from Thomas Skidmore's book, uh, Brazil, Five Centuries of Change. And we're today we're taking the information from chapter three. So uh, let's jump into it. Brazil, an introduction. So here's the outline. We're going to be talking about uprisings under the Regency. This was when Pedro II was uh, a child. Then recentralization under the emperor, the monarch of Brazil, Pedro II. The rise of the coffee industry, problems with slavery, questions of abolition, and the Paraguayan War, which had a tremendous and significant effect on Brazilian history. So the end of an age was the period between the return of Pedro I to Portugal in 1831, uh, leaving his child Pedro II behind to be the regent or the uh, monarch of uh, Brazil. Uh, this period goes then ends with the Paraguayan War in 1870 and is fundamentally the story of divisions within the Brazilian elite. These divisions were first reflected in a series of revolts during the period of the Regency. They were then smoothed over but certainly not extinguished in the period follow Pedro II's coronation in 1840. The tranquility was shattered in 1864 by the outbreak of war between Brazil and Paraguay. This is called the War of the Triple Alliance because Argentina, Uruguay, and Brazil entered into an alliance against little Paraguay, which increased Brazil's debt to the British. It reopened the conflict about Brazil's form of government and it increased doubts within the country about the durability of slavery. So the moderate liberals. When Pedro I returned to Brazil, he left an elite that was divided about how Brazil should be governed and what kind of nation Brazil should be. In the middle were supporters of the Brazilian monarchy and Pedro II. They were the more or less the centrists. They believed Brazil should continue as a single country remaining as an empire, but totally independent of Portugal. Called by historian Boris Fausto the moderate liberals, they believed in the defense of individual liberty, for the elites, of course. Uh, the role of Pedro II. When Pedro I returned to Portugal, he left at a divided elite. The term moderating power, as noted in an earlier chapter, was referred to the monarch's position as the balance wheel of government. It was at his invitation that governments were formed and dissolved. It was through the crown that the national patronage, the politician's lifeblood, flowed. The success of Pedro II's role would depend on how he used his moderating power and how the elite perceived that use. And here are some pictures of Pedro II. A couple of them are from when he was a younger man or midlife, and then one on the lower right in his older age. Pedro II brought a natural flair to his job. He earned, earned a reputation as being a fair, objective uh, monarch, projecting the image of an honest and ethical sovereign who would not hesitate to discipline politicians who were caught straying from his strict standards. Uh, quite a blessing in the modern age. There have not been many monarchs like that. Pedro II strengthened his image by presiding over sessions of the Brazilian Historical and Cultural Institute, Brazil's leading learned body of the day. He was especially interested in Brazil's heritage, indigenous heritage, and took the trouble to learn and speak Guarani, the most widely spoken Indian language. He also subsidized Brazilian writers and intellectuals. Then there was the rise of the coffee export industry. As you may remember, the predominant industry of Brazil in an earlier time was the production of sugar on sugar plantations, which depended on uh, African slavery. Uh, but now we have around 1830, a new export commodity that was arising as a dominant factor in Brazilian history. Around 1830, a new product appeared, uh, uh, which is coffee, uh, 
an export that would fuel Brazil's export export economy for the next 140 years. And you see there in 1650, there was no coffee being exported and quite a bit of sugar. By 1750, sugar had dropped by half. By 1800, sugar had further dropped. And then by 1841, you see a, a sudden rise of coffee exports. Coffee was su first successfully commercialized in the late 18th century in Brazil in the province of Rio de Janeiro, where the soil was highly adaptable to the coffee coffee bush. In the 1830s and 40s, the province became the center of coffee co cultivation, with the city of Rio as the export center. Rio housed the banks, the brokerage houses, the docks that connected Brazil to the world coffee market in Western Europe and North Africa. North America. Slaves were the main source of the considerable labor needed to plant coffee trees, cultivate them, and harvest what would become the coffee beans. This is a uh, contrast with Colombia, which also was a dominant player in the coffee export market. But in Colombia, cof the coffee uh, industry developed with small family farms that were pr pr primarily uh, run by uh, large families, and it created a Colombian rural or agrarian middle class. Increased demand for labor, of course, with the growing coffee exportation, there was a need, a desperate need for labor. And the southward march of coffee and the rapid rise of Brazilian production generated an increased demand for labor. With the end of the slave trade in 1850, in the southern provinces were forced to rely on the purchase of slaves from domestic sources, especially in the north and northeast. Of course, the slave trade ended in 1850, encouraged by the British, but slavery itself did not end until 1888 in Brazil. This created a demographic shift southward. The northeastern masters who sold their slaves received payment but this capital inflow did not stop Northeastern politicians from denouncing the loss of their labor force as it migrated south to the more prosperous, prosperous areas. In 1850, a land law was passed in Brazil decreeing that public land could now be obtained only by purchase from the government or by paying of taxes to regularize land agreements already made, making access to land more difficult for smallholders. This is the one of the main contrasts with uh, between Brazil and the United States was the pattern of land ownership. Twelve years later, the United States, in uh, which smaller holder access to land had always been easier than Brazil, took a very different tack. The U.S. government passed the Homestead Act of 1862, which encouraged uh, smallholders and uh, middle class and and uh, working class people to be able to acquire small land holdings. This drastically changed the culture, the political culture of the United States compared to Brazil in which large elite land holding, holding was the norm. Slave reproduction. Why was the Brazilian slave population unable to re reproduce itself? There were far more male than female slaves in Brazil for one thing, reducing the birth rate for that reason alone. Brazilian slaves were kept in such grim living conditions that their health was jeopardized, further reducing childbearing capacity of the Brazilian female slave population. The life expectancy of a Brazilian slave was only two-thirds of that of a Brazilian white man in contrast to the United States in the slave, slave period. The British were putting growing pressure on Brazil which was filled in several different ways. First, in 1826, uh, Great Britain pressured Brazil to sign a treaty agreeing to end the slave trade within three years. Although there was no support for this measure among the Brazilian elite, they were far too dependent on the uh, wealth that was generated by coffee exports and sugar exports. They could hardly explicitly resist the British, to whom they were heavily indebted both politically and financially. Britain's Royal Navy, the world's premier naval force, set out to in, in, intercept slave ships and liberate slave cargoes. In 
This led to global isolation for Brazil as a sort of a national pariah. By 1850s, the Brazilians' position on slavery made them increasingly isolated on the world scene. In 1863, U.S. President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation freed slaves within the Confederacy of the United States. And in 1865, the U.S. Congress freed the rest by constitutional amendment. This left Cuba and Brazil as the only two major slave states left in the Americas. I might point out also um, that there was a number of countries that ended slavery long before the U.S. Civil War, one of them being Colombia in 1851. That left Cuba and Brazil as the only major slave states. Brazil's isolation was reinforced by increasing pressure from Europe, especially Britain and France. Pedro II had become convinced that of the need for abolition in 1865 when he vis visited the Brazilian front during the war against Paraguay. The emperor found that the Paraguayans citing of Brazilian slavery was an effective anti-Brazilian propaganda and was true. So here is a graphic showing Brazilian's population growth by ethnic origins from 1798 to 1872. You'll see that the European population almost quadrupled, a little bit more than uh, grew by three times during that period. The African population uh, grew about the same, about three times, from nearly 2 million to just under 6 million. However, the big contrast was between the free and the slave portions of the African population. This is including mulattoes as well as uh, Africans. The free population grew from 400,000 to 4,254,000. Uh, 4, uh, so that's a huge jump in the free, the free colored population of Brazil. The slave population basically stayed about the same. Indigenous people also grew slightly, but not that much. So the big difference here was a jump in European immigration, but even a greater jump in the, a jump in the free colored population. Which means that by 1872, Afro-Brazilians was, was, uh, Afro outnumbered whites, but by a smaller margin, but Brazil was still a highly multiracial society. And I've already mentioned the dramatic change in the non-white population was the growth of free Afro-Brazilians who now numbered, outnumbered the whites, 4.2 million to 3.8 million. The slave population remained basically the same. Brazil's free society was heavily multiracial. Debate over abolition could not was very different than in the United States, therefore, because it wasn't a debate about how free Brazil might react if faced for the first time with the future influx of ex-slaves because there was already a huge population of freed people of color in Brazil. In March 1865, the Paraguayan forces trooped across the Argentine territory to Uruguay with the intention of countering recent Brazilian intervention there. Brazil claimed that it acted to protect its citizens living in Uruguay by sending military forces to depose the Uruguayan government and replace it with a pro-Brazilian one. Sounds somewhat similar to some current events going on right now in March of 2022. Paraguay's invasion of Mato Grosso was meant to undo the Brazilian intervention, but it ended up triggering a war that pitted Paraguay against the combined forces of Brazil Argentina, and Uruguay, which was called the Triple Alliance. This war was to last five years. The, the Plata River system furnishes essential transportation to four countries, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay. Uh, Rio de la Plata. That means the Silver River, because they used to float down the... Uh, uh, Rio de la Plata, they would float down barges full of uh, silver that was being mined in Bol Bolivia. For Brazil, the Par Paraná River, one of the tributaries of the Plata River, technically it was an estuary, uh, 
served as the important strategic function of connecting Brazil's coast with its far western interior. Since land travel to the Brazilian interior was extremely time-consuming and insecure, the best route from the east coast was to sail down the Atlantic coast to the mouth of La Plata River, up the Plata River to Paraná River, and then up the Paraná River. And here is a map showing uh, Rio de la Plata right here, which turns into Rio Paraguay, and it goes up pretty close to uh, modern Bolivia, Mata Grosso. Uh, but here's the Rio Paraná, which was the gateway to the interior of Brazil for Brazilian travel. Francisco Solano Lopez was the dictator of Paraguay, Paraguay, a poor, small Guarani-speaking country. Uh, even today, the uh, official language of Paraguay is Guarani, as well as Spanish, and more people speak Guarani than speak Spanish. Uh, it had only recently emerged under a series of military dictators as an amb ambitious new nation. In 1865, it was under the control of the latest of these dictators, Francisco Solano Lopez, who you see a picture of in the upper right, or you'll see it next in the next slide also. His political and personal motivations have long been debated by historians. Solano Lopez was so confident of his nation's military prowess that he was little inclined to be intimidated by his larger neighbors. Believing that Paraguay's independence was endangered by Argentine and Brazilian dominance in Uruguay and nurturing a tragic overconfidence in his nation's strength, he decided to intervene. Let loose the dogs of war, is the old saying. And once they're let loose, it's hard to put them back up. Brazil did not have a proper national army when the war began and the imperial government could not attract enough volunteers. So in 1866, it turned to slave forces in the army. They were offered their freedom in return for joining up with the military. And this caused a permanent change in Brazil's attitude towards slavery. The slaves who had been recruited to fill out the ranks of the Brazilian troops in return for their freedom after the war had acquitted themselves well in battle. They were good soldiers. Their performance had given the Brazilian officers a new appreciation for the capacity of Afro-Brazilians. No less important was the realization that Brazil had only been able to win by enlisting thousands of slaves. So this led to a changing of national sentiment towards slavery. The bitter end of the Paraguayan War, or the War of the Triple Alliance, came in 1870 when Solano Lopez... Uh, was hunted down and killed by the Brazilian troops. He had become paranoid and suspicious and had executed many of his own relatives. The nation of Paraguay had been reduced to rubble. Its dead was estimated at 200,000, which is a lot for a small country. No one knew exactly. And the male population was shrunk as much by three quarters. The, uh, the male population was so decimated in 1870 that in the 1920s, uh, women still outnumbered men in uh, Paraguay. The Brazilian military occupation of Paraguay continued for another six years. But this war had some negative consequences for Brazil and for the uh, monarchy, even though Brazil won the war ostensibly. First, the Brazilian army had received very bad press in the United States and Europe for its allegedly brutal tax tactics against Brazilian civilians. This reinforced their image abroad as uncivilized. Second, Brazil's attitude to, towards slavery changed. The slaves' performance had given Brazilian officers a new appreciation for the capacity of Afro-Brazilians. Third, the Paraguayan War set the stage for growing military-civilian tensions during the 1880s. And fourth, the war had a decisive effect on party alignments. The liberal government was increasingly at odds with the emperor in 1868, 
the Baron of Caixas, who had been the military commander during most of the war, had resigned his command in Paraguay ostensibly because of health reasons. But really, he was uh, returning to Rio de Janeiro in order to influence the emperor after having been awarded the title of duke. The Duke of Caixas was, Caixas was in good health. He resigned in order to use his prestige with the emperor to help out his conservative colleagues, his conservative party, in Rio de Janeiro in order to force out the liberal cabinet. This actually worked. The emperor dismissed the liberal government and invited the conservatives to form a government, despite the fact that the liberals held the majority in Congress. And uh, this created a lot of discontent and uh, eroded the, the uh, Pedro, Don Pedro II's credibility as a moderating influence and weak, greatly weakened the monarchy, leading to its downfall and the, uh, the substitution of a republican form of government for the monarchy, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. The war had a profound psychological effect on Brazilian self-evaluation or identity. Brazil had entered the conflict with little respect for the Paraguayan troops. Years of heavy combat casualties cured the Brazilians of their arrogance. It had taken largely Afro-Brazilian troops to achieve victory. It also had taken burdensome new loans from England to finance the war. Victory over such a poor, small, desolate country hardly qualified Brazil for the annals of glorious warfare, despite the triumphalistic rhetoric of some patriots in Rio de Janeiro. On the contrary, it raised fundamental questions about whether their own ill-integrated society was ready to join modernity. Okay, that is... Uh, 1830 through 1870 of Brazilian history. Uh, thank you for giving your time and attention. We will continue our review, our introductory review of Brazilian uh, Br Brazil and its history uh, next week. Thank you very much. Take care.